Hey CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here, and these are your Chapter 11 Lecture Notes on Human Population Change. Uh, this is the first installment of two where I'm going to go through all the ins and outs of how human populations have been changing over time in much the same way that we learned about population ecology in previous videos. Um, the first part of this video, this installment, is going to go back and revisit some of those ideas on population ecology and then part Two um, will be where we get into some specifics about human populations and what's going on there. So just to show you the depth and breadth of where we're going, I've got these outline slides for you here. Um, part one will be all about population growth and the dynamics associated with that um, from an ecological um, standpoint through conservation biology. And part two will be all about human populations, the perspectives on our population growth, fertility, mortality, demographic transition, all those sorts of things. So to begin, I want to spend some time with you uh, just reviewing some vocabulary, okay? Um, there are a number of terms that we spent time learning about in population ecology, and you're going to hear them again here while we're learning about people. So it's worth our time to take a few minutes and go, oh, that's what that word means again. So all these things in yellow, you need to make sure you know them, tattoo them to your brain, inside of your eyelids, whatever, but make sure you get them down and make sure you know them because they're going to be things on your quizzes and tests. So when you think about populations, we talked a lot about J-shaped curves and S-shaped curves as we graphed out numbers of individuals and how they changed over time. Um, and I used some terms, not just S and J-shaped curves, to describe what was going on in different aspects of those graphs. And here they are again. First term I want you to be familiar with is the term carrying capacity. As a variable, it's written into equations as the letter K. Remember, the carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals that can be supported by an ecosystem or a specific area um, indefinitely without depleting the available resources. Carrying capacity does not mean life is awful and everybody or everything is dying. It means that we've reached the maximum number of individuals that that area can support. Okay, And if we go above that, yeah, bad things could happen. If we're below carrying capacity, well, then numbers could increase. Um, that, that's where the next two terms come into play, overshoot and population crash. Um, humans are the only species on Earth that can actually look at their population size and make decisions about whether or not we should add or subtract to that population size or do nothing. Uh, lower life forms don't have that cognitive ability. So come springtime, it's just time to make more of whatever you are. That results in population overshoots, where the numbers of individuals in the population will exceed carrying capacity. Um, this obviously is bad because that puts more and more pressure on all those limiting factors, the density-dependent ones, uh, that could ultimately spell disaster for the individuals in those populations. Disaster in the form of a population crash. Now, population crash does not mean extinction. Like, this isn't the end of the world. This does not mean all life in this area is gone and now it's like a moonscape or something. No, no. What it means is that, yes, there will be a die-off that will bring the population's numbers back below carrying capacity, but not so low that, yeah, everybody is gone, okay? Um, if we were to look at a graph where these terms were playing out, um, this would you know, be something we would see on an S-shaped graph. And um, if we were really, really specific about that flat line part of the S-shaped graph, it wouldn't just kind of go up and then like nice, smooth, flat line. Um, you would actually see an oscillation around carrying capacity that we describe as a boom and bust type graph. Um, boom and bust basically means when the populations overshoot, you get this peak that goes up. So that's the boom. And when you have the die off, that's the bust. So boom is overshoot and die off is bust. Okay. We can also describe um, what's going on with a population mathematically. And so there's this little mathematical formula that I want you to be familiar with. It has some variables in it that we have to define. Um, the first variable is capital N, uh, which is supposed to represent your your population 
And as you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's like a, an NT and an N0. So that's just basically what is your population at a fixed time versus like, you know, where did it start? Okay, so this will allow us to predict like what our population growth is going to be like as a function of its growth rate and time. Okay, so basically the big N is the total number of members of a single species living in a specific area at a set time. N0 is the start and then NT is whatever that time period is. Okay, um, R is your rate. It's the rate of growth, the number of individuals which can be produced per unit of time under ideal conditions with no limits to the population growth. So limiting factors are thrown out here. It's kind of like saying if the average number of like babies per couple in the United States is like, I don't know, 2.5, then, you know, the growth rate would be like 2.5. And so without any other limiting factors every year, we should be adding 2.5 like new humans, like per couple across the entire United States. That means every couple would have to have 2.5 kids every year. That doesn't happen, okay? Doesn't happen. Anyways, um, then time, that should be self-explanatory, all right? Time is time, okay? So we plug this thing into a, a mathematical formula so that we can calculate a geometric rate of increase. Geometric rate of increase is the population size that would occur after a certain amount of time under ideal conditions and there's the formula, nt, the time you're going for, equals n0, your starting population, multiplied by your rate raised to the exponent of t, okay? Um, so we can start plugging numbers into this, and we can predict how big our population will be at a, a future time period based on where we started, what the growth rate is, and how many years have to go by, okay? This is a valuable piece of information for us because hey, it might like help us predict, you know, where we need to put like new police stations, fire stations. It might, you know, be, well, something that we use to predict how much we have to increase agricultural production just to feed people. There's all kinds of uses for the, this number. Now, um, this number could also help us see just how fast we're growing. And if our population is growing really, really fast, we might be in what we call exponential growth. Um, exponential growth is growth at a constant rate of increase per unit time, uh, and basically it has no limit. Um, so your population gets bigger and bigger and bigger, faster and faster and faster. Here's an example, okay? So this example of a geometric rate of increase using cockroaches. Um, cockroaches reproduce 10 offspring for each adult roach per three-month time period. And using that geometric rate of increase, we could calculate that, well, after just four generations, right, two cockroaches that started all this could lead to a population in excess of like 2,000 individuals breeding at that fourth time period, okay? Um, the conclusion, a single pair of cockroaches can produce a population of 20,000 roaches in a single year. So that T over there on the side, where it's T1, T2, T3, well, that's a three-month time period, okay, because that's time. So I don't want you to think like T1 is one year, T2 is two years like that, okay? And there's your big N. That's your population. Your growth rate is 10, so they're going to have 10 babies, like every time they have babies, and there you're multiplying your rate times your N, and that's where we get all these crazy numbers and tons and tons of cockroaches, right? gross. All right. In terms of people, just to kind of give you an idea of how this plays out for us um, without getting into too much uh, human stuff, I'm going to show you some graphs that you probably remember from our population ecology unit. Um, this is human population growth over um, the past several millennia. And basically, if you go back in time to, well, when Mr. Kennedy was in high school in the 1800s, um, you know, our world population was sitting at about 1 billion people. Um, it took basically, according to this graph, hundreds of thousands of years to get to 1800 and 1 billion people on the surface of the earth. All right. And a lot of people go, well, why? 
why did it take so long for us to get to 1 billion people? Well, the idea is, and I can testify because, you know, I was alive in the 1800s. Life was hard, right? Like I'd have to walk miles just to go like find, you know, clean water and stuff like that. It was terrible. Okay. Um, so now life is full of conveniences and modern medicine and all kinds of things like that. So since life is easier, then it kind of makes sense that more babies survive to adulthood, more people then are having children, and subsequently our population is growing faster and faster and faster. If you're a student of history, you know that right in these areas here, um, births basically equal deaths. It's not carrying capacity per se, it's just that life is hard. And then right about here, we get some really cool things like agricultural industrial revolutions that provide more food for people and more, you know, comfort. And then our population literally starts to explode, right? And it's on this exponential growth curve or this J-shaped curve uh, still to this day. Um, there's been a lot of predictions on like when we will hit carrying capacity as a, as a human population. No one can guarantee that. We'll deal with that more as we get deeper into this. But I can tell you that that number varies quite a bit. I mean, there's 7 billion people on Earth. Some people say that the Earth can maybe only hold 11 billion people and that we'll hit that by about the year 2050. I can't promise you that. I don't know. But that's just one, one person's idea. So um, with human population growth, like we're getting rapid, 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 rapid growth. OK, it's growing really, really fast. Going back to our cockroaches. Right. In that previous example, we can project growth at a specific time period using that equation that I showed you a while ago. But in reality, like cockroaches and even people like we don't ever really reach our biotic potential. Right. If. We're going to say that cockroaches have 10 baby cockroaches every year. I mean, that would have to be perfect conditions where like no human knows what the concept of the bug spray raid is and no cockroaches die. OK, so the reality is, is that it's a mathematical prediction. That's why I said with human population growth, some people say, hey, we'll hit like 11 billion people on Earth by the year 2050. Really? Will we? I mean, that assumes like ideal conditions and what happens if conditions are not ideal well then we won't hit that number and same thing with the cockroaches okay um so as we think about um all of that um such change where things you know aren't really in reality um well we have to factor that into anything that we say using these formulas like we can't just guarantee, yes, in the year 2050, this is exactly what this population is going to look like. Um, the change can be described by modifying our previous formula. Um, and as you look on this slide, we can see dn divided by dt equals r times n. So that d now is like, you know, your the delta, which represents change. OK, so it's your change in population over your change in time equals the rate times your population. That's how it all fits together in verbiage. OK, and that simple mathematical model is supposed to give you a more accurate representation of population growth. Here's a couple other examples. OK, um, so this is the world's where the world's population expected to reach uh, by 2050 in another model. Right. Um, here it's in, it's indicating that well maybe we'll only reach 9.1 billion by by 2050 with virtually all population growth occurring not in places like the United States but in less developed countries um, across the globe. Can we guarantee that? No. Um, if something bad were to happen in one of those developing countries, you could stymie this like nobody's business and maybe our population just sort of levels off and does nothing. Or flip side could be true. Something great happens across the globe and we greatly exceed this number. So it's a mathematical prediction, but not a guarantee. Um, here's another way to look at that formula and to make sure that you have it down in your notes. OK, remember that D is for the change in number n or population per change in time and then the r times n will give us the rate of increase um you know uh in our population size okay um exponential growth like 
no matter what we're talking about, humans, cat, dogs, fish, frogs, whatever, there has to be a limit, a cap to how big populations can get. Okay, so exponential growth can only be maintained by a population as long as nothing limits its growth. Okay, and nothing means nothing. Like there can't be a disease, there can't be famine, there can't be competition for any kind of resources. Like everything has to be perfect. Now you tell me where on this planet that exists. Exactly. So in the real world, there are always limits to growth um, that populations will encounter throughout you know, their life cycle. Eventually shortages of food and other resources um, lead to reduction in population size. Heck, if we're talking about humans, like people could just choose not to have kids because I don't know, maybe they don't like kids, right? I like you guys. So that's not the case anyway for me. So um, at the end of the day, like that's a reality. Like humans, just they, they choose whether or not they want to you know, have children, lower life forms, all these other things come into play. Um, so can a population increase be supported? That's the question. If our population is growing exponentially and we use these mathematical formulas to figure out like how fast it's growing and how soon it's going to reach a mark, we have to deal with this question. Can that increase be supported? Do we have enough resources to go around? Do we have enough police and fire protection? Are we growing enough food? Or do we have enough housing? You name it, right? Those are all questions that we got to talk about just for people. For lower life forms, it really just is about food, water, and space to live. Um, so when you think about can a population increase be supported, basically what we have to measure is that food supply, right? How much food is available to feed a population and then what is available in surplus and whether or not that surplus can absorb the population that is coming in the years to come. Now, if you're a lower life form, like you have no concept that this is going on. Like you just have offspring and if they survive, you know, through, I don't know, the winter months, the spring, the summer, whatever, if they make it through the year, then you did all right. Okay. Okay. Um, but literally lower life forms have no cognitive ability to look at the world and go, yeah, we got, um, we've got quite a food buffer going on right here. Um, they don't, um, the only way they know they don't have that food buffer or they can't support that population in the future is all their babies die, right? Because they starve, right? I mean, that's horrible to say, but that's what happens. Okay. That's where we get that boom or bust. If we're talking about humans, well, now we can actually ascertain whether or not we do have a food um, surplus. And if we've got an issue with population growth where we don't have a food surplus, well, then we can make and take steps to um, like increase our food production through what you see on this bottom graph, innovation, new technology, like putting more field uh, into production that maybe we're sitting fallow from the previous year. Like we can do our part. We can even use things like fertilizer to make plants produce more food and pesticides so that the food they produce is higher quality and the like, right? I mean, we have those abilities. Lower life forms don't. So um, when we think about the future population of our planet and like how all of these things come together, you know, again, there's lots of projections, right? I've got some over here. A low end projection would say by the year 2050, our population only hits 7.7 .7 billion with a high population of being around 11 billion or on this graph, 9.1 billion. What's going to, um, you know, make the difference on whether or not we get there? Well, all that other stuff we just talked about, the innovation, do we have the food surplus? Can we feed all these people? Disease, space to live, you know, all that. Currently, our population um, worldwide is growing, if we talk about a global sense, um, at about like 1.1% annually, okay? Um, there was a time for a while that was growing faster than that, but right now it's growing at about a rate of 1.1%. So if there's anything that happens globally to impact, you know, survivorship for babies or even just the human desire uh, to have large families, like that can impact these projections in either a positive or a negative way. 
All right, ladies and gents, I'm going to take a break right here. Give your finger a break because you've probably been writing frantically trying to keep up with Mr. Kennedy here as he's been talking. Um, we're going to get back into this in just a minute on another video and dive into some things that are super specific to what's going on with people, demographic change, and all of those sorts of things that I mentioned previously. All right, so I'm Mr. Kennedy. Remember... All these videos are always available on my YouTube channel. I will see you next time.